Welcome all. Hardware problems, don't you love them? Hopefully the screen will continue to display the presentation. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm called Roger, Roger Orr. I've been, I feel like Alcoholics Anonymous, I've been coming to the C++ um, for many years. Uh, regular speaker here and on the conference committee. So if you've got any questions, comments about the conference itself, then feel free to grab me as well. Looking at nothing is better than copy or move. And whenever you look at something like this, I think it's quite useful to look back in history. How do we get here? Why do we have copy and move in the language in the first place? Some of you look nearly as old as me. And you may remember way back. Let's start with the more, more recent meeting. Richard Smith, who authored this paper, is here this week. And I did try to persuade him not to be in the room. <laughs> Good. I think he's not here. So at the June 2016 meeting in early, we approved a paper called Wording for Guaranteed Copy Elision Through Simplified Value Categories, which is obviously completely trivial. Uh, and the paper removes an oddity that's been in the language for a very long time. And in particular, one of the things it removed was the oddity that the compiler could elide a copy, but only if it was valid to call it in the first place. So if you couldn't call it, you're not allowed to take it out, which seems a little bit strange. Um, but it may also have been a great excuse to put a whole new term into the language. So we now have temporary materialization conversions. Doesn't that sound good? Makes you feel happy to be alive. <laughs> but to explain it, as I said, we need to go back a bit to some context. Who's ever seen this book before? Good, we're in the right room. First edition, 1978. I won't say how old I was, it could be embarrassing. And in 6.2, Structures and Functions, it says, there are a number of restrictions on C structures. And the essential rules are all you can ever do with a structure is take its address or access a member. That's not very much. So, they can't be assigned, can't be copied. It kind of reflects, really, the, the kind of background of programming in assembler language, where what do you have to play with? You've got memory and you've got registers. And what do registers hold? Well, numbers or addresses. So you pass around addresses. So for K and RC, all you could do with structures was to pass them in or return them from functions as pointers. And some of the C functions we still use have similar APIs still. Struct TM star local time, const time T star timer. So it passes in a pointer, passes out a pointer. And of course, this code is still valid in modern C++ because we inherit nearly everything from our distant ancestry. What's the problem with pointers? Don't all speak at once. But there are some benefits. Efficiency. You could put everything in a register. Whether you were returning a number or a pointer, didn't matter. It fitted in the one register, which would have a machine word in it. Only one object. It doesn't matter how big that structure is, you're just passing a pointer to it. So its cost is independent of the size of the structure. You can use opaque types. So in Microsoft, Microsoft in, uh, in C, when you open a file, you get back an opaque type, a file star. What's in a file? Well, you don't care. It's not your problem. In fact, you're probably not that easy to find out. It's an opaque type, but it comes back as a pointer. Very simple interface. You didn't need function prototypes because you had three arguments. You put three registers values on the stack, and you get back one. Nice and simple, but a little bit inflexible. And there are, of course, just a few problems with 
passing and returning pointers. The biggest problem is I'm passing back a pointer to something. Well, where does that something live? And that's probably one of the biggest problems with pointers. Who's ever had such thing as a, as a dangling pointer? Anyone here? Yeah. yeah. Bit sad, really. So what are we going to return? Well, we could return a local object sitting on our stack out of our function. Who thinks that's a good idea? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it is a great idea. It just doesn't work. If only it worked. The advantage of a local structure is you haven't got to worry about allocating it. It's just there on the stack. There's no cost of allocation. It's there on the stack. You just return a pointer to it. Problem is, just after you've returned the pointer from it, the stack gets unwound and your object disappears. Poof. And now you've got a pointer to, well, who knows what? You might be lucky. It might be the same value that you had in it when you returned. But that won't last for long. So we're going to need to get hold of memory from somewhere. Uh, maybe the heap. That's OK. We'll allocate memory on the heap and we'll return the pointer. Whose responsibility is it now to destroy the object? Hmm. Mine? Well, only if it's a heap object. Supposing they decided to return instead the address of a static object. Well, how can I tell from pointer star whether I've been given a heap object or a static object? Fork and core dump. Yeah, that's an approach. <laughs> Does it scale? So you end up with conventions. You end up with people putting names in functions to indicate whether or not they're returning new memory or static memory. Or you just leak. I mean, hey, you know, memory's cheap, right? Just leak a bit. A few gigabytes. Kill the program and start again. And then you've got these problems about pointers might be invalid. Uh, another thing about pointers is there's one special value. It might be null. So what's it mean for a pointer to be null? Um, there's a big discussion at present about string view, which some of you have probably heard about or participated in. Um, is it valid to pass a null in? Should it be valid? Is it good? Bad? Could it be a bug? Well, obviously it could be a bug, but could it also be by design? It's not really a, an easy right answer. So, I could work up. The second edition, the C programming language. Now, ANSI C. And that came out a little bit later on, 1978, moved on to 1989. In the intervening 11 years, people had understood how to copy things. To be fair, the early version did say these restrictions will be removed in forthcoming versions, and they were. So you could now create a structure and copy it into the calling function, or return a structure by copy. And that was the main change for structures in ANSI C. And it had been supported by a number of compilers for a while, which was a good thing, because it meant people knew it could be implemented, because it had been and, and worked. But now you could rely on it, which obviously, if you're writing portable code, you couldn't previously. Um, it seems to me that quite a lot of C programmers failed to notice this change, because quite a lot of C code still just passes pointers in and out, even though there's no good reason to do that in many cases. So, how does the magic work? Now, you may or may not have ever thought about this before. Um, I suspect many of us don't. We just use it, and it works. So, let's think about passing a structure into a function. Well, that's the easiest one. What do I need to do? Well, I need some memory to put the structure in. Well, where do I get the memory from? Well, on the stack, obviously. So, push the stack down a bit. I've now got my memory. Copy the data in. There it is. As long as the receiving function knows how to find that block of memory, everything's good. So what you can do in the calling convention um, is the, the caller knows that the second argument is a structure, so it's expecting to find it on the stack at kind of return address plus a word. That's where the structure will be. What kind of makes sense? There are other ways of doing it, but that's the simplest and probably the most efficient way of doing it, using the stack. 
So for example, with a simple stack-based calling convention, you call a function here void foo, it takes an int star uh, example, just by struct, and a third argument, another int. And when we go off and call it, then whoop, I know there's a gap there, but it's easy to forget. When you call it, you push, normally from the right hand end, push to, reserve space on the stack, copy in this local structure, push one, call foo. All makes sense? And that's what a lot of compilers did back in the day, and that's how it all works. Of course, most modern calling conventions are really excited about using these things called registers to pass arguments. Why? Fast, yeah. Um, someone was saying earlier this week that we think about memory, we think about level one, level two, level three, caching. Well, you could talk a register as being level zero. It's memory, but you can access it. It's there straight away, no cost effectively no cost. So modern calling conventions tend to want to put things in registers, which doesn't really fit so well with this kind of model. So what we typically find in 64-bit calling conventions is the first few arguments to a function are passed in registers. So what we do now is we do things in a different order. We reserve space on the stack for our structure, because it won't probably fit in general in a register, and then we copy x into it, and then we load 1 into some register, and we load the address of the reserve bytes into another register, and we load 2 into our whatever third registry is for the calling convention. So what are we effectively doing here? We're passing a pointer. So although the syntax talks about passing example by copy, under the covers, the compiler is actually creating a copy and passing a pointer to it. Interesting. And you can tell this easily in action by just printing out the addresses of the arguments. Somewhat to my surprise, this even works. So you just print out the address of arg1, example arg2, and the address of arg3, and you kind of would expect them to be in either ascending or descending order, depending upon which way around your compiler pushes things. But in the 64-bit calling convention, you'll find it's probably not like that. So in my experimentation, I think I was using, I think it was MSVC, but you get similar answers in many compilers. The addresses relative to argument one, in the 32-bit case, were four, size of int, and then 28. So my example structure, presumably, is 24 bytes in size. Bit of arithmetic there. Whereas in the 64-bit case, the second argument is 32 bytes off the first argument, and the third argument is only 16. Huh? What's going on? What it's doing is it's creating the third argument, when I take its address, on the stack, but lower down than the dummy argument that it's created and passed in. So there's a bit more going on under the sort of behind the scenes with accesses to memory when you're using a 64-bit calling convention than you might be expecting. <laughs> and then look at returning a structure. And that's slightly more difficult, because where are you going to allocate it? As we heard earlier, if I return a local structure, what happens when I return? It goes away. So where am I in the called function going to find memory to return my structure? Well, the answer is, typically, you don't. What you do is you rely on the caller reserving some space and then telling you where to put it. So it's a protocol that both the caller and the callee have to, have to follow and obey, which is why it becomes really rather important, even in ANSI C, that you've got function prototypes, so that you and the compiler both agree about what the conventions are when you call. So typically what happens is the implementation reserves stack space in the caller for the return and passes the address of that into the calling function. And then the calling function can build up the 
returned argument in that memory. And when it returns, it's still there because it's in the stack space of the caller. So sort of pseudocode for returning some local variable in this function foo is loosely put in the caller we have a local variable on the stack and we pass it in as a hidden first argument to the function and then when we get back we mem copy it into here conceptually Real compilers may do it slightly more efficiently than that, but that's effectively what's happening. And in fact, at some point, I couldn't remember which version it was on, I think it was MSVC 6 and 7, if you looked at the debug symbols for a function that returned a struct by value, there was actually something with a name like double underscore return UDT dollar, which kind of was leaking out implementation details of how it all works. And then in the call E, uh, it just finds this first argument and just copies into it whatever it's returning, our local variable. So we've got a couple of uses of, of mem copy. Not really great for performance, potentially. Tend to be a bit of a bad smell. We'd like to get rid of that. So enter C++, which was first called C with classes. And a particular interest in this area is that structures and classes now have extra stuff in them. Special member functions, constructors, copy constructors, assignment operators, destructors. So you can't necessarily simply just call memcopy. Bad things might happen. So you have to replace some of those calls to memcopy with calling potentially user provided functions. Which means, of course, the cost becomes even more. It's not just the overhead of copying a few bytes of memory, but also a function call, function return. You know, it all gets a bit messy. So although they're really helpful for design and that you set up all sorts of class invariants and make sure they're uh, retained and make sure you copy things correctly when you uh, create a copy of an object and destroy things correctly when you destroy an object, the do do have some cost associated with them in general. And additionally, while in some cases the compiler can poke inside and say, hmm, that copy doesn't do very much, or I can prove that the store is dead and be eliminated, in general, you're making calls to functions that are elsewhere in the forest, and it may not have access to the internals of them. It may not know whether they can be elided. It may even be using some sort of virtual class hierarchy, having virtual calls to destructors, which it's a bit harder for the compiler to reason about whether it can take them out. And there may, of course, be side effects in your copy constructor. And the compiler would be badly behaved if it took out side effects. Who thinks that would be a bad thing for compilers to do, take out side effects? I mean, you wouldn't know your program was working because all the things you care about basically are side effects of the program. So, we had a rule in the annotated reference manual. Who remembers the arm? Anyone remember the arm? Yeah. Uh, saying that you were allowed. The fundamental rule, Bjarne writes, is that the introduction of a temporary object and the calls of its constructor and destructor may be eliminated if the only way the user can detect it's gone is because of the side effects. So there's a few places in the language where it says you're generating a, a temporary and, and copying it. Well, the only way you can tell it's a copy is if you put side effects into the copy operation. So that's one place where you are allowed to get rid of the side effects. Of course, the problem is, ha, may. Or possibly may not. How do you know? How do you tell? Well, of course, you put a side effect into the copy constructor, and then you can tell. Uh, and, and actually, that's quite a useful thing to do, as we'll see in a bit, to uh, detect whether you're getting copies or not. The other way, of course, is to play around with the tool, uh, either straight disassembly or to look at something like Godbolt and see what the compiler is actually doing. But the mainness was a bit, a bit sad. But about 10 years ago, Sean Parent came and did a talk at ACCU, and I was in the room 
Was anyone else in that talk? Sean Parent talking about move? Very good talk. He started out with various bits of code and, and showed them and said, right, I, I want you to tell me, how many objects do you think are created in this bits of code? And we were all completely wrong. It was really quite funny. So let's start with an object with side effects. I've called it life cycle because it helps to see the life cycle of an object. So we have the standard set for C++ 98. And all they do is log that they were called. And then in our main program down here, we create an object of type life cycle from a default constructed life cycle. So what do you expect? In theory, linguistically, we've got a default constructor and a copy constructor. What do you think you'd see if you compile this program on your average compiler? without optimization. Anyone want to guess? There are only two choices. You've got a fifty percent chance of being right. Constructor destructor? Anyone think you'd see a copy constructor? Take a vote? No. Maybe. No. Whoops. That's not good, is it? Ha. Technology. Yeah. Of the speaker of this thing. There we are. So, from the wording of the standard, you might expect to see default constructor, copy constructor, destructor, destructor. And in fact, you'll find that although it says they might be elided, almost all compilers you're likely to try in almost all modes, whether optimizing or not, will work out that it doesn't need to create a temporary and then copy it. So what you almost always see is just default constructor, destructor. Um, well, that's okay. That's a nice easy one. It's all on the same line. I mean, you'd expect compilers to be able to make sense of that. Let's try something a bit more complicated. So I've got a, a whole object now, not just a little life cycle. And um, it takes a string. By, by copy. And with one particular version of Visual Studio that I was playing around with, I did actually get out successfully default constructor, copy constructor, destructor, destructure. Now, is that a bug? No. Sadly, it's a feature. I mean, it probably caused by a bug in the compiler, because they did fix it in the next version. But it wasn't technically a bug, because it's only a may elide the copy constructor. So another C++ 98 example. Here we have a source function. I'm using source here to mean anything that returns a structure, or, an, or a class, an object of some sort. So I, I'm going to create a temporary using the a int constructor and, and return a copy of it. And in here, I'm initializing my x, copy initializing it from the return value. OK, pretty simple code. I hope you all agree. What do you expect to see printed out? Create, destroy. Create, destroy. Copy anyone? Two copies? How many copies? Yeah, so again, <laughs> you're never going to find out. Yeah. Let's, uh, let's try. Yeah. yeah. It's somewhere like there, I think. Yeah, <laughs> that will probably work better. <laughs> so, every compiler I've tried, with or without optimization, does what you'd hope. Default constructor, copy constructor. And this, of course, is, is C++ 98. It's not a new thing, but it was still only it might do this. And the third one is you've got a function that's a sync. It just takes a structure, and in this case, does nothing with it. But obviously, you could you know, 
do something useful with it. And I'm using, I'm wiring together a source and a sink. Oh, now about this one. How many copies might there be? How many calls, how many places in this syntactically do you need to have a copy constructor or an assignment operator? And then how many times will the compiler actually put one in? Two again, three, four, how many views? Let's see if I can avoid going back to the beginning. Yes, even unoptimized VC6. Yes, I still have a copy on my laptop somewhere. Still just produces default constructor, uh, constructor and destructor. That's it. That's cheating VC6 was compiled Even more recent compilers than that. But, you know, it's been there a long time. And the compiler writers were very good at detecting when they could throw away copies because they weren't actually needed. <laughs> yes, yeah, you could throw the whole thing away. I, I should have put something in that actually did have a side effect. Well, I've, I've got, I've got those. Some of them can be elided. Um, and that's kind of where we were in C plus ninety eight with one extra little wrinkle, which is named return values. And these are different because names are powerful, right? You've given it a name. I've now got technically a different object than, than X. So again, there's special wording in the language which lets you, again, it's a may, you can elide the copy and just return the named return value. If you, the compiler writer, can work out how to do it. So again, people have probably come across this sort of thing and, and used it. But this one depends. Again, looking at older compilers, even with maximum optimization, some compilers do not take advantage of NRVO, named return value optimization. And there are some cases where they can't, because you can put extra things in the code to make it impossible to use it. Peter? Yes, it probably would be a fair comparison. Uh, I mean, trying out newer versions of GCC, even with C++ 98 mode, they've still got the technology under the covers that can do cleverer things. Um, but there's a difference, and the difference is to do with the fact that it's, it's a named object. And you can actually take its address and print it out in one place and take its address. And technically, they are separate objects, and they should have different semantics. So although it's possible to remove the copy, it's not mandated. And that, that hasn't changed. So this one is still there. Uh, question from the back? Is that true? <laughs> Yeah, it's not to do with accessibility. It's just the fact that they are different objects, different named entities. But not at the same time. Not at the same time. But that's, th they are, you know, th they've got names, they've got lifetime. Uh, so it's observable when the named object starts and stops. Um, so there's special wording for named return values to give the compiler the option of removing the a copy. Louis? Yes. Then you would say, oh, they don't have yeah. You could you can write some interesting code uh, that kind of basically says this code only works if the addresses are different. <laughs> and then it will only work if you don't get NRVO and conversely. So it, it's it's slightly harder to work on. So the wording is something like, if the expression in the return statement is the name of a local object, an implementation is permitted to omit creating the temporary object to hold the function return value. And it's not necessarily obvious whether it's invoked or not. And it's quite easy to, for it to be fairly fragile and making a fairly innocuous change earlier on in the function suddenly disables NRVO. Oops. There we go. So, C++ 11. We're now only seven years in the past. Introduced Move Semantics. Yay, let's hear it for Move Semantics. Yay. Yep, thank you. Who likes them? Who doesn't like them? 
Who doesn't like the fact they can do your head in every time you think about how many options there are now to do anything? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. So, first of all, our little simple struct lifecycle now needs to have move constructor and move assignment operator added. All good so far. And the other change is that named return values effectively become our values, become temporaries. So, going back to our example, we've got source, it creates an object, it returns the object. It can now return in C++ 11 by move. Doesn't need to be a copy. So if it's got an accessible move constructor. So you've now got three choices to think about. You might elide it completely using NRVO. You might use a move constructor or you might use a copy constructor. Which is best? Well, you, you hope for NRVO because you get nothing then, which is better than either copy or move. But second best, you might get a move, which for some objects is going to be cheaper, not all. And then the last case, you get an actual copy, and the whole thing is done. And you can actually break code doing this, which is a bit sad. Fortunately, it doesn't happen that often, but I, I did toy with whether or not to put this slide in, but I thought I would anyway, just in case you come across it. So here we have an example of a struct foo. And foo's purpose in life is to print out ending and then the label, which you provide by reference in the constructor because you don't want to go anything expensive like copy stuff. So inside our foo bar function, we create a string, we pass it by reference into our f, and then we rely on in the destructor of, of foo printing out the string value. Problem is, we may get name return value optimization on s, which means at the point when the destructor is called, S may or may not have been moved from. Yeah, it's kind of scary. So, the order of events, forgetting about named return value optimization, the order of events is um, I hit the return statement, I've got an S in my hand and I'm returning a stood string. So, C11 rules, I now move construct the string out of S. So I've moved out of the string. What's the value of the string now? Unspecified. Unspecified, yep. It may contain a string. It may contain nothing. It's still valid, but unspecified. Now I exit the scope, and I call the destructor, and I print out the string, the moved from string. Oh, dear. So I might get a blank. If the implementer of string is unfriendly, I might get anything. Possibly. Be a bit sad. With name return value optimization, that effectively doesn't do anything because I've built my return in the target's address space. So S is still valid when I return. So you end up with code that works on one compiler and doesn't work on another for really subtle reasons. So, the obvious solution is don't do that. That's a little tricky. Um, it's, it's quite a rare problem. I mean, when it does bite, it's nasty, but it doesn't happen that often. Jason? <laughs> yeah, I thought someone might notice that. Um, yeah, it's fun, isn't it? If we go back to the wording, I can give up with the thing. It says, if the expression in the return statement is the name of a local object. I've put parentheses around it. Is it or is it not the name of an object? GCC seems to think not, and Clang seems to think it is. <laughs> <laughs> So that will compile differently on the two compilers. 
which slightly worried me, and I might raise an issue about it, but I'll probably be told, well, it's only permitted anyway, so who cares? So it's a particular problem with things like scope guard helpers, which uh, Peter has been busy working on and standardizing. I, I put a note on your behalf. Yep, yep. Yeah, I think it was Richard Smith who encountered the, the, the thing in, in live code. Um, you just got to be quite careful. The issue really is taking care with references to things that are going to be returned. And that's the, that's the, the thing to be careful about. Yeah, it, it's just kind of getting in your mind that return now is, is, is doing a move, potentially. Oops. So rolling forward, except we've gone on two slides. In C++14 and before, we had this term copy elision, which is you've got what looks like a copy, and syntactically you've got to have a copy constructor accessible, and then you just take it out. But that's kind of the wrong way around. And in fact, the general practice, as we've seen, in most of the cases, most compilers already took it out because they were allowed to. And in fact, even better, most of them take it out even without optimizing. And that seems a bit strange, but one of the compiler implementers explained. The rules about copy elision are very, very careful, and there's only a few places where you're allowed to elide a copy constructor. You can't, in general, delete a copy constructor. So it's got to be the syntax parsing end of the compiler that determines whether or not it's safe to remove a copy. And so since you've already determined it's safe to remove it, why not just remove it, rather than passing it on to the optimizer to take out? Which is why most of the compilers I've played with, it makes no difference whether or not you enable or disable optimization for whether or not the uh, move and constructor copy constructors get elided or not. So the wording though made it optional. So C17 now talks in different words. It talks about PR values, which loosely is a is a pure R value. <laughs> Typically in this context it's some sort of expression whose Evaluation will initialize an object. And it describes very carefully the rules for when a PR value is used to actually instantiate an object. Or in the words of the, of the paper, uh, to materialize an object. Of course, we've got a problem now. We can't call it copy elision, really, because there's no copies to elide. So what should we call it? Well, I think we can probably just carry on calling it copy elision because it's the, the copy being elided is the one in your brain that you thought was there. But someone suggested copy evasion, which I quite like. Um, someone else, I think it might be Nico, suggested deferred materialization, which just sounds so cool, doesn't it? <laughs> so come up with a phrase you like. But the thing about the new wording is it makes it clear what behavior is required. So it's no longer a maybe, it's now a thou shalt. And if not, you've got a bug you can report against your compiler vendor. So the rules also cover temporary objects generated during expression evaluation. And some examples, I mean, it's not an exhaustive set, but some examples of where a PR value gets materialized. Um, one is you initialize a variable. So you've got a variable on the left and an expression on the right. So you're obviously exp expressly turning it into an object. You might be binding to a reference. So I've got a temporary object, but I now invoke a method against it, or I bind to it. And in both of these cases, we're again materializing an object. So you end up with effectively exactly the same rules as we had in C++14 and before, except some of the permitted, well, it's changed it round. You're only allowed to create an object in certain cases. And if you're not allowed to, in the other cases, you can't. So in this kind of contrived example down here, where I've got auto A equals string, double quotes A, plus string, double quotes B, plus a dot C underscore str, there's quite a lot of, of temporaries being created here. 
So I've got an example of, of the first case here. I'm creating at the end of the day my variable A. So I need to materialize the, the temporary expression on the right hand side, whatever I end up with, into A. I've also got an operator being called, which is going to operator plus normally takes two arguments by reference. So I'm binding to a reference to a temporary and this thing. And here I'm performing member access. So again, there'll be another temporary materialization conversion here. So you end up with effectively the same rules as before, just worded differently. However, it does now mandate in C++17 that in this case, the temporary materialization conversion means no actual copy or move is permitted. So if your compiler puts one in, it's wrong. And secondly, you don't even need to have a copy constructor or move constructor available. It, it just isn't used in this case. Yep. Yep. So I'm calling C underscore str. So I've formed a, a member access here. It happens to be a, a, a function member, but it could be a data member. So I'm basically, it's saying, I'm, I'm calling something here against an object. I better have an object. Oops. So a C17 compiler must produce output just calling a default constructor and a destructor for this code. There's no, there's no may in there, which is really good news changes almost no actual code, but does change people's view on it and people's mindset. And also means you don't have to have a copy constructor. So in this case, I've got a non-copyable structure. I've explicitly deleted. And in C++ before, then that line of code was invalid. Even though, as we'd seen, all the compilers in the planet wouldn't do the copy, they needed it to be legal to have it first before they took it out, which always seemed a bit strange. So let's revisit this example. We've looked at that how that now can become a move if you don't use named return value optimization. But we've also got the temporary materialization conversion into X. So this does not permit copy move from the temporary. It's got to construct that directly from the return result. Now, don't be too clever, although it might be useful to think about it in terms of stood move being invoked when you do a return. What happens if you put it in explicitly? What could possibly go wrong? I mean, it, it's, it's an R value anyway. What stood move does, well, it, it makes it into an R value. Isn't that just the same as what you get without it? But it's clearer because it's made it explicit. Anyone ever seen a warning out of Clang Tidy on stood move on a return. Yeah? Did you look at it and think, what? I did the first time. And then I realized what's going on. Um, we can't use name return value optimization now. It's not the name of a local variable. It's an expression involving a local variable. So the compiler is not allowed to remove the move constructor call. <laughs> so now the best you're going to get, consistently, you're always going to get it. You're going to get a move constructor call. You won't get the best case of all, which is nothing. Is it correct to say when something is implicit in our return express statement, it's like a PR call? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that's how the wording is puts it. It treats it as a, as a, as a PR value. So actually explicitly using stood move on a local variable disables an RVO. 
So the best you can get is the same as you would have before, and the worst you can get is an extra object being created. Another example where we return a, just a straight int and we're relying upon the default constructor generating our RA. And again, in C++17, it's guaranteed that that will print default constructor and destructor. And if not, you complain to your compiler writer. And syntactically, again, in this place, you don't need a copy constructor, which is great because there's quite a lot of objects that you might want to generate that you don't want to copy, but you do want to allow them to be created from what would syntactically be a copy. And in terms of implementation, mostly this was just standardizing existing practice by the major compiler vendors. I, don't, I haven't heard of any compiler vendor who had to actually make changes to get this to be supported. There might be some, but I've not heard of one. So you've got to be a bit careful. One bad object now can, can poison the move. So I've got my copyable structure, just copyable. What's missing? Move. Um, how difficult is it going to be to move this object or copy this object? Well, it's, what's it got in it? Nothing. Nothing. So it's really easy to move or copy, and they're identical in cost. So why would I bother to write a move constructor? Well, the problem is, if I put it in something else, <laughs> like one of these, when the compiler generates the constructors, it can't generate a move constructor if one of the objects can't be moved. So my little, well, one byte possibly, zero byte with uh, empty b object optimization, um, that little object there now prevents moving my logger object, or possibly something rather more expensive, which is a bit sad. So, who was here for the closing keynote four years ago? Jolly good. Howard Hinnant gave a talk about all you ever wanted to know about move semantics and couldn't stop them telling you, uh, where he did a very good talk. And if you haven't seen it, um, it's still on the ACU conference YouTube site, so you can go and find it. Um, he was the person, really, that was behind a lot of the work behind putting move into the language in the first place. And he produced a, a one slide which summarized the position, which had a matrix of all the special members. So I, I do not expect you to learn that necessarily now, but it's good to have it somewhere where you can refer to it. So what he's done is he said, if I declare as a user one of these, what happens to the compiler generated everything else's? Who thinks this is a bit complicated? <laughs> yep. So the best thing of all is to be is to be here. Because then everything else is defaulted. Or next best is to be here. Almost everything else is defaulted. But by the time you get down to writing your own move assignment, you know, just bad things happen, complicated things, things it's very hard to remember. So the, the basic advice is don't write special member functions yourself if you don't have to. Who's come across the rule of three back in the day? Yeah, if you write one of copy constructor, assignment operator, or destructor, you probably needed the others. And then that kind of briefly became rule of five. Five's too many, so now it's a rule of naught. Don't write any. If you've got objects that need special handling, encapsulate the bits that need special handling in other objects that do the handling for you, and just compose them. So wherever possible, you want to avoid writing these things. So, a oh, question. All right, so some sort of complicated dependency where it needed to see inside other things. Yeah, I mean, there often are cases where you do need to 
for other reasons, and possibly performance reasons, and there's some cases, I think Andre Alex and Jeske did some measurements as to whether explicitly declaring a, a destructor uh, had any measurable benefit or not. So, but, but in general, you know, try, try not to fiddle with the special members. The rules, are, the rules are very complicated for a reason, but they are quite complicated. So if you've got some data needing manual management, can I compose it out of a helper object? And the next simplest rule is to say, well, what I will do is I'll just explicitly equals default or equals delete everything. So at least I've always got all five, six listed, uh, but I've said what I'm expecting. Right, comparison, we've got copy and move. Which is better? Meh. For what? Yeah, copying or moving, I guess. The performance differences between them are the, are the ones that most people got excited about. And one of the nice things people found when they moved to C++11 was a lot of times code just worked faster without making any code changes at all because move was invoked in some places where copy had been. But for some types, it makes no difference. For an int, copying an int or moving an int, what's the difference? Not very much. If you read the value after it had been moved from and it was different than it was before you started, you'd be very worried because it's going to have to actually do work to make it different. So it's going to be slower than a copy, which is just wrong. So I've got j equals i and k equals stood move of i. There's not going to be much difference between those two in any terms of performance or code generation. And that's true as well if you've got more complicated structures. So if I've got a stood array of a thousand ints and I move it, what's it going to do? It's going to copy a thousand ints. Move is not magic. Move is magic when you've got a vector of a thousand ints because it just moves a couple of pointers and that is quicker. But it's not a panacea just to move things. So typical cases where things are faster is where what you've got that you're handling inside your class is, is some sort of pointer or a handle where the difference between moving and copying can be really large and you either have to allocate memory in the copy case or perhaps even make an operating system call to clone a handle in the, in the case of a, of a handle wrapper. Whereas with a move, you just transfer ownership by transferring the value. There's a little bit of cost, of course, with things like pointers and handles. If you move from them, you've got to set them into the right state so that the destructor doesn't go and try and delete them. So they're, again, not cheap, not completely free of cost, but a lot better than copy. Which is partly why there was this desire in C++17 to make it more clear under what circumstances both copy and move could be elided. <coughs> so, it's complicated. How do I know whether I've had a copy or a move done? And the answer is, in general, it is still complicated. But there are some simplifications you can make, which most of the time are absolutely uh, true and simple. So, Absail, tip of the week, number 77. If it's got two names, it's a copy. That's a simple rule. It's wrong, but it's work most of the time. When doesn't it work? NRVO. It's got two names. Pass by cons reference. reference, yeah. So there are cases where it doesn't work, but in general, if it's got two distinct names and neither of them are references, then in general, you've got two objects. If you've got one name at once, it's a move. And if you've got no names, it's a temporary. That's definitely true. The older style of copying and passing things around in C++ was you typically passed and returned pointers. Or, hey, we're C++ programmers, we pass and return references. What's the difference? Meh. Syntax, Syntax and, and null. In terms of under the covers, it's much the same how it's actually implemented. 
So it may still be the case that passing a large object by Kant's reference may be better than attempting to copy it. Or move it, possibly. And similarly, trivial little objects, a, a point that's got two ints in it, that might be optimal already to make it trivially copyable. And there's some special rules in C++17 for passing um, trivially copyable arguments and deletable, so that the compiler can actually create extra copies. You think, extra copies? Why do you want extra copies? Well, really, you want extra copies when you want to put something out of memory into a register and pass it to a function. And technically, that's an extra copy. But the cost is, well, it isn't. Because you've got to get it into a register to do anything with it in the first place. And so there's some wording that lets you uh, allow small objects, trivially copyable objects, to be passed in registers. So if you've got a small data structure that contains simple primitive types, um, that can benefit from this wording. But each ABI will have its own restrictions on what qualifies as small enough to pass that way. So, Microsoft Visual Studio, x86, x64 conventions. For 32 bits, you can pass suitable structures up to eight bytes in size, can be returned in a pair of registers, which is quite nice, saves a bit of potential use of memory. And the 64-bit calling convention lets you pass one, two, four, or eight byte structures, can be both passed in and returned in registers which again is nice, and it means you haven't got the problem that we looked at earlier, where if you pass a structure by value, that you actually pass the address of something on the stack. If it's a small structure, it just goes in a register. So there's no indirection at all. The Linux convention is similar. You can pass things up to four bytes in size in the 32-bit calling convention, and the 64-bit calling convention let you have one, two, four, eight, or 16 bytes can be supplied and returned in registers. So it's nearly the same, but not quite. So the 16 byte case is different, which if you're writing really, really, really high performance code that has to run on two different platforms, you might care. Measure, find out. Most of the time, you shouldn't care. It might be worth looking at the generated code if you're absolutely convinced that just the act of passing this thing in and out of the function is really your bottleneck. It, you may be right, but you might have got other things you can best spend your time on. Uh, does it also require the special uh, rule of the, uh, the type trace is uh, trivially copyable, which requires to be defaulted? That will depend upon how the ABI for your particular platform is written. Okay, so, so there may or may not be... Okay, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a bit of a shame. Um, one hopes that implementers would attempt to make the two match. But I, I don't know whether that's guaranteed. So, how should we pass arguments to functions? Well, in C++ we've got two ways, right? Pass by value, Passed by const reference. Well, or maybe by pointer. Or maybe by a smart pointer. Must be better. How do I choose? What have I missed? So before C++11, it was very common to have a function that returns something, and you passed in a reference to it. Who's used or seen that kind of code? Yep, very, very common. Um, has great benefits because you don't have to worry about the copy. Of course, we've taken out the copy now in C++11 and beyond, so that's good. And so normally, you'd expect to see something that just returns it, which has other benefits. Um, it's possible that if it is expensive to move, you may still want to pass by reference. But one of the drawbacks of the first approach is what are the preconditions on result? Is the person who wrote foo expecting me to give them a default constructed vector? If I give them a vector with 17 entries in it, do they overwrite them? 
append to them? Crash? Who knows? This one is unambiguous. And with a combination of temporary materialization and named return value optimization, it's most of the time going to be uh, perfectly efficient. But it may be better if your function actually takes a copy of an argument, not to pass it by reference, which you might normally do, but to pass it by copy. So here's an example of add name one, where we would probably have in the past taken a const ref and then put it into some kind of collection. What we can do now is we can pass it by value and move it into the collection. Other methods exist as well, but I'm trying to make it as comparable as possible. Um, is that better or worse? Mm, depends. It's different. So you could arbitrarily you know, make decisions on different days. If it's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, prefer. Um, what are we paying the differences over? Well, whoops, should be a call site. If the call site has to construct the argument, then the second call can avoid a copy because we can create the argument, the temporary argument, in the argument we pass in. Whereas with the const ref case, we've got to create an argument and then pass the reference in and then copy it into our, onto our target. So we end up with a, um, two objects being created. And in this case, we end up with one. With small string optimization, how small is a small string? It depends. It, it depends, yeah. Could be 16 characters or something. Could be more. So even a quite a decent sized string. The um, difference between copy and move may be immaterial. Alternatively, you can go big time and you can have two overloads. One takes const ref and one takes ref ref and then both do the best. But of course, that's painful. You've got to write the code twice. In fact, if you've got more than one argument, it's two to the n, where n is the number of arguments this applies to. And the code you write will be very subtly different. There's a move here and there's not a move there, and you better get that the right way around or bad things will happen. <laughs> so again, if you really are trying to squeeze the absolute last bit of performance out of your code or you're writing library code that may be used in those sort of environments, you need to think about this. But for most of us, most of the time, just pick one. Just be aware of the, of the consequences. Uh, one thing I, I was quite surprised by, shared pointers. Who uses shared pointers? Anyone? Yep, yep. They're great, aren't they? Sometimes. Who, who likes using unique pointer? Yeah. And where you can, unique pointer is much better. But you can't always. Sometimes you do actually need to share things. Yep. And then a shared pointer, as the name says, is really the best thing to do. But what you don't want to do is pass shared pointers as arguments. Because it's got to increment and decrement use counts, which in the standard shared library is an atomic operation, which is not exactly cheap. So in the core guidelines, it actually says, take smart pointers as parameters only to explicitly express lifetime semantics. So if I'm wanting the target wants to take ownership, take a copy of the shared pointer, I'm, I'm constructing an object that's going to have a, then it's worth passing in a shared pointer. If all I'm going to do is operate on the shared pointer, do not pass in a shared pointer. There's two reasons for that. One is because it's bad. And the second is because you then can't call it if all you have in your hand is a regular pointer or reference. So you've restricted the number of times that you can use this function. So here's an example. Void action one is passed a argument, shared pointer by, by value, and it invokes do something on it. Okay? Does it need a shared pointer? Does it use anything about its sharedness? And I can't call that method if all I've got in my hand is a local variable of type uh, foo. I'd have to create a shared pointer 
to call the function and then delete the shared pointer, which is pretty stupid, really. Action 2 just takes by reference. And of course, you can wave const at that as, as appropriate. Also, to my mind, the second case actually expresses intent more clearly. You don't want, in this case, someone to provide me a default constructed share pointer. What would happen? Bad things, probably. Because it's expecting that arg points to something. We've got ways of expressing that in C++. They're called references. So we can pass in a reference to foo, and that says straight away, null is not an option. So it's clearer what's going on. Also, to my surprise, it generates a lot of code. So I just played around with clang 6 minus 02, test 1, 94 assembler instructions. Wow, that's a lot. It's generating in line all the code to do the reference counting for the shared pointer that it was constructing and destructing that's passed in, even though it's a reference. It's doing a lot of management because it copies it to call action one. Number two, what, what do I guess? I'm starting at 94 going down. How far down shall I go? Two. It just says, um, well, get the address and jump. That's, that's pretty impressive, 94 to two just by changing action one to action two, uh, a shared pointer value to a reference. So that, that was quite a shock for me. I, maybe you guys have come across this before. I was expecting a difference, but not a 94 to two difference. Admittedly, some of the 94 uh, instructions wouldn't be executed in the normal path because they were uh, unwinding code, but most of it was actually mainline code. So again, nothing in this case, using a reference is significantly better than using a copy. A bit more on NRVO. Uh, it's quite fragile, and people occasionally ask questions about why isn't the compiler using NRVO here? And they show some example code, and you look through it, and you think, well, because it can't. And if, if you really think about what's happening, you'll understand why. So here's a very simple example. I've got multiple return values from this function foo. I create a string. If some error condition occurs, I return nothing. Otherwise, I return result. And it would be quite nice if NRVO could take place here. The problem is, going back to how it all works, uh, whose memory is this object, this NRVO object, going to use? It's the caller's memory. The caller's allocated a bit of space on the stack and has passed its address in. When it comes back from this function, or if this function throws at some point, um, it thinks it's got an object sitting in that bit of memory. It's going to destroy it. So it would create our initial x in the caller's memory. And then it's going to return an empty string. Where? In the caller's memory that it's just used to create a string with the value x in it. Uh-oh. So you'd have to destroy it. So you create x, destroy x, and then fill it with a... That's just bad. And if you've got any sorts of side effects in there, you're going to get all sorts of weird stuff. And if you start thinking about what happens if exceptions occur, and deciding how you're going to unwind this object that you're not quite sure what state it's really got to, it gets quite complicated. So NRVO is not magic, and there's, there's reasons for that. And having some idea of, of what's going on when uh, the compiler is doing this optimization is quite useful. Similarly, Look at function arguments. It would be quite nice if NRVO could happen here. I could pass something in and it, no objects would be created. It would just return it. If you've got some sort of filter function that you want to call. But again, 
although it will move the argument, it can't invoke an RVO in general. And the reason is, again, that, well, the caller is going to create this object, and the caller is also going to pass in the address of where it wants the result to be in. So the caller has got to decide that the function is going to use NRVO and create the argument in the same spot that the return value goes in. How does that work? And it doesn't know, in general, whether the called function is or is not going to use NRVO. So it's got no way, before it starts, of knowing whether it needs to allocate one object or two. So although it seems that local variables and arguments are very similar, and it's kind of a puzzle why an RVO doesn't apply to arguments, um, if you kind of, again, think about what's happening and who's responsible for creating the objects, it becomes fairly clear why you can't, in general, NRVO uh, an argument. <laughs> so, since C++11, there's been a lot of focus on adding support for move to code. And many of us weren't that aware of how good existing C++ compilers were at taking out <coughs> copies anyway, already. Now we've got wording in C++17 that makes it explicit, um, and so we can rely on it. It's not down to just how good the compiler writers are, but it's actually part of the language. And while move is good, and in many cases considerably faster than copy, and for certain things, you don't want to generate a copy anyway. Uh, not so much things like memory, but resources like, uh, like locks or file handles. So move has got a lot of benefits as well. It's even better if you neither move nor copy, but just create. So before you throw std move into all your code to make it go faster, make sure you know what's happening. Make sure you know a little bit about the rules for when the compiler is allowed to not generate copy constructors and when it can create objects uh, in the target even though it looks as if there's a copy going on. <coughs> okay, go forth and write code.